Hey, this is David, pastor of Hamilton Life, and I want to thank you for taking a listen to our podcast. For more information on our church and how you can support the ministry, you can visit us online at hamiltonlifechurch.com. Thanks again for taking a listen, and we hope you enjoy the podcast today. Hey, good morning. Here we are, you, me, and uh, God, and I believe you get something for us. So if you're ready to receive something from the Lord, I want you just to say, I'm ready. Good, good. We've been in the conversation, we've been in the conversation for uh, a number of weeks now, where we've talked about what it means to be created. And uh, two weeks ago, we talked about being created to be in liminal space, created to live in the in-betweens of life, because we don't know what's next but we know we don't want to go back, and so we're in between, and we've been created to spend time there. We talked about what can actually happen in the in-between. And then last week, we talked about being created for um, something else. What are we talking about? Created, I've got notes. Anybody else remember besides me? Because I don't remember. Created to create. We were created to create. We talked about the reality that the great creator created us to create something beautiful with our lives, that all of you are creative. Whether you feel like it or not, you are creative because God has made you creative. And so we lean into that. This morning, though, I want to talk about being created new. I want to talk about being created new because here's what I know about you. Without knowing all of you personally, here's what I know about you is that there's a good chance, strong chance, that you have made some kind of mistake in your life. And we're not going to share our mistakes, but I guarantee you that every single one of us have made bad decisions at some point in our lives. And I don't mean like... That was a bad decision in hindsight. I mean, like, this is going to be a bad decision, and I'm going to make it anyway. That we all step into those moments where we know we shouldn't do what we do, but we do it anyway. And then what happens is shame and regrets and failure is heaped upon us. What I feel like happens when so many of us gather together like this is that we are a collection of our weights. That we're all carrying a weight. Whether it's shame, guilt, uh, inadequacy, failure, uh, maybe it's just sin in general. We're all carrying some form of weight with us, and I know that it's holding us down. And what happens for us is that we carry that weight so long that we start getting used to it. You start not noticing the weight that you carry anymore because it just becomes part of who you are. That shame and guilt just becomes part of your identity. And then you come into a room like this, and we invite God to to heal us or to repair us, only to step out into the world and see that that wound gets reopened immediately, only to walk back out and get hurt again. And I don't know if you're here and and you're a a product of maybe multiple opportunities for God to heal you and you just got hurt again and you're uh, you're, you're carrying those open wounds. And what happens is the longer those wounds stay open, the more chance you have the opportunity for infection to set in and you start becoming toxic. We start getting uh, angry or better because we ask God to heal us, and he does, but then we just open those wounds back up. See, what I believe happens is we get stuck in failure and sin and inadequacy and mistakes so often, and we get buried under this weight of problems to the point where we don't need God to heal us or repair us any longer. We need God to make us new, that we don't need another healing. We need something brand new. And a lot of times we ask God for a healing when we should be asking God to recreate something because what we have is so full of holes and so broken that it doesn't need to be patched back together. It just needs to be recreated. But here's the beautiful thing about the God that I serve. Not only did he create the world around us, but he continues to create in your life and in mine. And he's not just great at healing. He's great at creating. He is the great creator. So I don't know how you walked into this room uh, feeling. I don't know if you walked in with the weight, if you walked in feeling broken, if you walked in hurt or wounded, you walked in just a, a product of your pain. You may not even recognize the effects that that pain has on you and the lives of the people around you. I don't know how you came in this room, but here's what I know to be true, and I would stake my life on it, is that God is here and he wants to meet you in your pain. And he doesn't just desire to heal you or plug you or patch. He doesn't want to just patch you up and send you back out into this cruel world. But he actually wants to create you brand new. He wants to do something totally new in your life. And there's this passage in Mark 2. 
In Mark 2, uh, there's this interesting interaction with Jesus, and Jesus is actually uh, talking with some men, and, and, and he was confronted about fasting. Uh, there were some of John the Baptist's disciples who were fasting, and they noticed Jesus' disciples were not fasting. And so they confronted him. They said, why aren't your disciples fasting as well? And Jesus ends up taking this beautiful opportunity to speak about what it means to really change, to speak about what it means to recreate to do something different, to live a different way, not with ritual, but actually live with authenticity and integrity. And Jesus responds in several ways, but one stands out more than others. In Mark 2, 21, he says, No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new patch pulls away from the old cloth, and a worse tear is made. Look at verse 22, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost as well as the skin. But new wine is for fresh wineskin. Now, wineskin sounds gross. If you thought boxed wine sounded gross, wineskin wine sounds terrible. In context, though, what Jesus is saying is that essentially, you can't put new ideas into old mindsets. What Jesus is essentially saying is that you can't get new results with old behavior. That's from my throat. Not a big deal. <laughs> the idea is that so many of us want something different from the life that we're living, but we keep living the exact same way. That we never make changes. We never invite God to do something new or fresh. We want the results or the reward from hard work, but we don't want to put the work into it. We don't want to change, but we want results from a life that is changed. And what Jesus is saying is that you can't put new wine into old wineskins. The reason is that wine uh, begins to ferment. And as it ferments, it begins to expand. As the gases are released, it begins to to expand. If you have new wineskin or a new container, it's able to adapt to the expansion. It's able to adjust to what's taking place. However, if you have an old wineskin, it's already adapted and adjusted to the wine that was in it to the point where it's old and brittle. Now you put new wine in that, all of a sudden it's filled to capacity and there's no room for it to expand. Not only is the wineskin ready to break, but if it breaks, you end up losing the wine too. That you lose both. And I I often ask myself, what new ideas am I trying to put into old concepts? What new and fresh miracles am I inviting God to do in my old, stale life? Where am I trying to fit new wine into old wineskin? And the result is troubling. It's that we lose both. See, I don't think God invited you here this morning, because I believe he did. I believe you're here because God has invited you into this space one way or the other. I don't think he invited you here to heal you this morning. I don't think he invited you here to repair you this morning. I think God invited you here to create something new in you. And I don't know where you're at, but I'm ready for something new. Are you ready for something new? See, we don't have to wait till January 1 for the new year to start fresh. We can start fresh right here and now because the creator of heaven and earth is right here and he's ready to create something new in you. But you have to allow him to. You have to place yourself in a position of receiving, to receive something new, to stop trying to put old wine, or new wine rather, or old, we don't want that either, in old wine skins. We want something new. And so we have to open up ourselves to the possibility that what God wants to do in your life and mine is bigger than what he's ever done before. But see, we limit God by our preconceived ideas of what he's capable of doing. God's done this for me in the past, and so he's only able to do that. But God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we ask or imagine. That the reality is that we're limiting God because our container is too small. See, a goldfish only grows to the size of the tank that it's in. And then it dies, and you flush it, and it's sad, and then you get another, and then you keep doing that until you get tired of the process. The idea, though, is that the goldfish is going to grow beyond the size of the tank. See, I have to wonder how many of us in this room have grown to the size of our tank, and we're hoping to grow larger, but we're not willing to change tanks. How many of us have reached our spiritual capacity... We're no longer capable or able to see God do anything new or fresh. And you may have gone five years or 25 years, and you're still expecting God to do something, but you're not willing to step out of where you are to receive what God wants to do next. And I think God is inviting us to stop looking at our lives as if we need repair and start looking at it as if we need something new. We need a bigger space for God to be able to do more. We keep asking God to fix when we should be asking God to make new. 
And so the first place that I think God needs to make new is God needs to make new our heart. I promise it's just throat spray. Psalms 51. Psalms 51 talks about something new. It's David, the psalmist, and he says, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. See, I love this passage. David is crying out to God, and he says, create a clean heart. I love the word create. Not only is it uh, our series, our conversation name, but it's actually a big theme in my life because I love creatives. Uh, most everything, if not everything, in our lobby, really even on our stage, are, are things that people in our community have created. The offering box in the back is something that someone in our room has made by hand. The, the drawings, the paintings, we're about to have another painting commissioned in the lobby. It's been handmade. I love makers and dreamers and creators. And what I love when this word is used is that it draws a very clear comparison to the fact that God doesn't just speak it into existence, but he handcrafts it. He's creating it. And David's saying, create a clean heart in me. Create a clean heart in me, a fresh start. The reality is that if David's asking for a clean heart, it would imply that the heart that he has or had was not clean. The reality is if you and I need to ask God for a clean heart, then we probably don't have a clean heart at the moment. See, what I've found to be true in my own life is that over time my heart gets corrupt. My heart drifts away from compassion and love and kindness for others. And it starts turning inward to uh, want to please self. What I've noticed is over time, my heart becomes uh, self-important. It becomes uh, looking for what it needs over what others need. What I've found that over time, my heart becomes filthy. And it's beyond cleaning. It needs to be renewed. And David is in the same boat when he's saying, God, I don't need it to be cleaned or refreshed. I need a brand new heart. That a clean heart means that God isn't just going to fix something. He's going to create something. That we think that many of us are too far gone for God to do work in us. And that's what happens. is that we end up living our lives in so much sin and failure and mistakes and, and just, just normal human mistakes that we end up being buried by. It and we just think we're too far gone for God to do anything for us or in us or through us. But I want you to know that God is... Not looking at you, imagining that you're too far, but he's looking at you and waiting and imagining for you to just come back to him. And this idea that you're too far gone is placed into your mind by the enemy because the enemy wants you to run as far as you can from God. And he wants you to believe that God isn't for you, but he is, and he's inviting you back in, and he's waiting for the opportunity to create something clean in us. And as we become jaded and corrupt and corroded, God comes in and he begins to do something new. And I love that this speaks to the nature of sin in our lives because a lot of us end up in sin and we think it's manageable. We think it's small. We think it's something we can control or contain. It's just a simple lie. It's just a little bit of this. It's just an excess of this. It's not hurting anybody. When in reality, what sin does is it erodes our souls over time. I keep a coffee cup, and I make tea now uh, and because uh, I'm British and fancy. The idea is, though, that as I make tea and I keep making it, if I don't actually physically scrub that cup, there's a residue. There's something left behind, even if it looks clean. I can rub a, a paper towel inside and it's not clean. See, I think even when your heart looks like it might be clean, there's residue there. There's something left behind because sin doesn't ever leave us untouched. You can't dabble in sin and come out of it. It's not manageable. It's beyond what we can control. And sin doesn't just affect you, but it actually affects the lives of the people all around you. And what sin does is it blinds us to the reality that we need Jesus that we need Jesus to do something new. And David is crying out. He's saying, create something new in me in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we'll confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, the idea that we can be clean from unrighteousness is actually pretty liberating. See, what these authors are doing is they're inviting the creator of the universe to come and to create something in them. 
They're calling the God who focused his creative potential in making heaven and earth to stop and to turn towards me and you and to create a new heart in us. And what's beautiful about God is that he can also speak heaven and earth into existence, but he can also step right into your heart and your soul and create something new in you as well that the great creator desires to work on you. And so the second thing that I think needs to happen that we have to create a new heart, but I think the result of the new heart is a new life. That the result of having a created heart, a new heart, is a life. The problem with so many of us, though, myself included, always, is that we try to have a new life without a new heart. So we try to, create, we try to change our actions and our behaviors without actually changing our hearts. The result is that we end up making a mistake again. The result is we end up to the same place we started. That God isn't inviting us to start a new life or to create a new life. You don't get new ID cards and, you know, you can't fake ID and go run from whatever your problems are and just start a whole new life across the country. God isn't inviting us to a new life first. First, he's inviting us to have a new heart. And the result of a new heart is that we create a new life. We create new actions. We create new behaviors that the old is gone, the scripture begins to describe, and the new has come. And what God is doing is he's saying, let the old go. Let it go and invite God to do something new. But we can't change behaviors without changing our heart. It starts with us pouring out what we hold and allow God to pour into us this new wine. It starts with us creating a new container and allowing God to pour in us the new wine that can contain what God wants to do. See, I think a lot of us get to a place where we're too tired, where we're too worn down, where we're too exhausted, where we've lived with this lie that we're a failure so long that we don't even recognize when God wants to do something new in us. That your life and mine gets so full of holes that even when God does give us something new, it just pours out. That we don't need God to repair or patch. We need God to create new. And the result of a new heart is a brand new life. But I need you to know that you're not defined by your sins or your failures or mistakes. You're defined by your ability to give your life back over to God over and over and over and over again. That's how you're defined. That's how God sees you. He doesn't see you for the last time you made a mistake. He sees you for the time that you turn your life right back over to him again and said, God, do something new in me again. And you might be in this room and you might say, yeah, I've done that, and I've done that, and I've done that, and I've done that. Keep doing that. Don't give up. Don't stop asking God to do something new in you. Know that God still wants to create. You're not too far gone, and he keeps creating. He keeps creating, and he keeps creating if you'll ask him. And you'll be defined by your ability to give your life over to God. So stop asking for something fresh and ask God for a fresh heart first so that when God does something fresh, you'll be able to contain it but we can't expect different results with the same mindset and behaviors. We can't get something new with the old mindset and behaviors that our lives are a direct result of uh, pain and hurt and heartache. We just are. We're a result of getting bumped around in this thing called life. And every single one of us, we all have scars. All of us do. Some of us hide our scars better than others. But we all have scars. But your scars are not proof that you've been wounded. They're proof that you've been healed. Your scars are not proof that you've been hurt. They're proof that you've been made new. Do you know that the skin that covers your scars is new skin? It's not old skin. That'd be weird. It's brand new skin. Your body has this beautiful and confusing uh, potential to create new skin. I have, I think, eight scars across my belly. A lot of knife fights. It was crazy growing up. Uh, the idea, though, is that God doesn't just patch the old skin over top of these wounds. He gives us new skin. And the new skin is proof that you're alive and that you're healed and that your body is working the way that it's supposed to be working. See, for you and I, we often look at our scars as proof that we're hurt, but God doesn't see us for our wounds. He sees us for what he's done in our lives to bring healing to us. And so I don't want our focus to be on how often we've been hurt because if we get stuck in how often we've been hurt, we get buried under this weight of sin and guilt and shame, and God wants to free us from that. And he wants to shake us out of that, and he wants to move us into the new. And I believe God's waiting for us to step into the new. And in 2 Corinthians 6, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. 
Old things have passed away. And look, new things have come. See, I believe when you invite God to change your heart, you're made new. And what happens with healing is that it ends up being infectious. Healing is infectious. When God starts doing something new in you, all of a sudden it starts spreading to the people around you. That the people around you end up benefiting from what God is doing in your life. See, the idea isn't that we should be hiding our scars. The idea is that we should be looking for ways to use our scars, to leverage those scars, to help point people to God. That our scars are our opportunity to point people to a God who heals remarkably. We were... uh, driving down to the beach uh, a couple of months ago, maybe it was in the summer, and uh, we were driving down the road, and we had a flat tire. And uh, as we were driving the flat tire, you could hear it going down, so we pulled off to the side of the road, and, and I changed that tire in like five minutes flat, if that's a good time. Like, it was quick. It was so quick that people were like, wow, you should be on a pit crew. And I was like, yeah, maybe one day. The idea is that I changed it quickly uh, to, a, to a donut, you know what I mean? Like the small little things that you're embarrassed to drive around on. And I, I took the next exit, I, and I actively looked for the, for the most backwoods Alabama tire store I could find, and I found it. If you need a reference, I can send you that way. And, uh, and I was there, I pulled in, and I was talking to this kind gentleman, and in between tobacco spits, he told me, he said, uh, he said your, tires, your tires are too far gone. I said, no, let's just plug it, man. It's like five bucks to plug a tire, you know, so let's just plug it. My family's going to be fine. You know, we're going to get down the road. He's like, no, no. He said, you don't understand. They're dry rotted. They're too far gone. And in that moment, I had to make a decision. Do I want to pay the price to put all new tires on my vehicle, or do I want to risk patching it, plugging it, and continuing on? And I think all of us sit right in this room right now with the exact same decision. Do you want to pay the price to have something new in your life? Or do you want to invite God to just keep patching and plugging and hoping that you can contain what he wants to do in your life in the condition that you're in? And I think a lot of us end up doing that for so long. We keep blowing tires. We keep blowing tires. And God's saying, just let me give you a new set. But see, we have to pick our pain. We have to pick our pain. Nothing is without some cost to us. We have to pick the sacrifice we want to make. And a lot of us are making sacrifices and picking a pain of trying to do life on our own when God is saying, just give your life to me. Just sacrifice your life to me. But it starts with your heart, and it transfers into your actions. It starts deep inside of you, and then it starts changing in your behavior. The last way that we end up finding new life created in us is God wants to create a new testimony that a result of a new heart and a new life is a new testimony, that the way that we live our lives becomes our testimony. The way that we live, the way that we conduct ourselves becomes how people see us and know us and becomes the way we spread the gospel. But a uh, quick question, does anybody remember the first time they walked? Anybody remember when they first walked? I wasn't there, but you fell, okay? That's just what happened. You tried to walk and you fell. The second time, anybody remember that? You fell then too, probably the third or fourth. You might still be falling. I don't know. We can help you with that. The idea is that every single one of us, that first step that we took, we fell. That second step, we fell. If you're raising a a small child, they're still falling everywhere, bumps and bruises and tripping. and you got to baby pad everything and proof it all and keep them safe because they're falling. Your life started with you failing. Most of your adolescence was you not knowing how to feed yourself, not knowing how to go to the restroom in a proper space, not knowing how to walk on your own. You fail most of your life, but do you remember it? No. See, what happens is we remember our failures more often than our successes when we give up. We remember our failures more often than our successes when we don't get back up and keep trying. But we remember our successes more often when we put the work into getting up, giving our life back over to God, letting him do something new in us, and we stop becoming defined by what we couldn't do. We start being defined by what God is doing. And that's the challenge that we all face, is to get up, to get up. None of us are perfect. Not a single person in this room is perfect. Not a one of us. Every one of us fell off our bike when we tried to ride. We missed the baseball when we tried to hit it. We just, we've all failed immensely. We're a collection of failures, and that's what I love about us. The idea, though, is that God doesn't see us for our failures. He sees us for our tenacity, for our ability to get up and to keep going. It's the focus that changes the testimony. What do you focus on? That's what's going to determine the testimony. It's going to determine how God sees you and what points people to God is how you focus your life. So I've got to ask you, what have you given up on? What have you given in on? What have you quit on? 
What if you decided that it was too far gone or that you couldn't come back to God or that God was done with you? What have you given up on? And God wants to step in and he wants to revitalize that dream. He wants to bring that back to him. He wants you to get up and keep trying. Get up and keep moving. But you have to allow God to create a clean heart, a new life, and a new testimony. See, we all want the new testimony without the clean heart, but you don't get the testimony without the heart. You don't get the clean heart without the sacrifice and the determination and the desire to keep getting up and giving your life to God. And so what areas of your life have you just decided that you're a failure? Have you just lived with the idea or the label that you're a sinner or that you're a mistake or that you're not good enough? What areas of your life have you given up on? And God wants to step in. He doesn't want to heal, patch, or repair. But he wants to create new, if you'll allow him to. But what happens for so many of us is that there's this constant narrative that plays over and over in our heads. It's this constant voice that keeps going over and over in our heads that says you're not enough, that says you're a failure, that says that you're going to make a mistake again. Why try? You're just going to fall again. Can you imagine if you lived with that mindset as an infant? Well, I'm going to fall again. Maybe I'll just not try anymore. Maybe I'll just stay put. Maybe I'll just stay on the grounds. It's fun to crawl anyway, right? Let's just stay here. The idea is that you can't quit. You can't give up. You've got to keep moving. And God is compelling and he's drawing us. But the narrative inside of our heads keeps saying, stay down. Stay down. It's easier to stay down. And I need you to know that in the short term, it is easier to stay down. It is. And I love I love living in a pity party. Anybody else love pity parties? It's like you can bring the chips and guac and we'll hang out together in a pity party because for a moment it just feels good to just sulk. I've decided, this is personal, but I've decided that anytime something uh, happens, depending on how tragic, but if it's mildly tragic or not tragic at all, but I feel like it is, I've decided 24 hours, 24 hours, that's going to be my sulking time. You don't want to call me or come in contact with me for those 24 hours. After that, it's done. I'll put it to bed. We move on. If it's major, obviously we work through that differently. But the idea is that most of what we encounter is not major, but we treat it as if it's major. I love living in self-loathing and self-pity. The idea is God wants to shake us out of that and do something new. See, there's rewards waiting for us to step into. But he can't give us the blessing that he desires as long as we continue to live the same way. So let's change the narrative. Let's stop the record that keeps going over and over saying that you're too broken or too far gone. So here's what I want to do this morning is I want to give you a new mantra. I want to give you a new narrative to to replay over and over in your head. I want to give you something that you can repeat to yourself and you uh, can remind yourself when you're in that slump or you're in that moment where you don't feel like you're good enough. You can tell yourself what I'm about to tell you. And so we'll put this online or you can write it down or you can just memorize it. I don't care what you do with it. But here's what I want you to do. That's great. I want you to, I want you to take this. And I want you to embrace this, and I want you to, 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 to play over and over in your head uh, as if it was just on repeat. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to repeat this after me. So I'm going to give you the words. You're going to repeat it after me. Say, I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. I have the mind of Christ in me. I release old thoughts and feelings. I let them go. I change my thinking from lack to plenty, from illness to health, from old to new. Everybody say this, I am transformed. Say it again, say I'm transformed. Tell your soul that you're transformed. I am transformed. Father, we thank you that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we step into the new, that we reject and we resist the old. We allow it to fall away so that you can something fresh in us. And so, Father, we embrace that in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Everybody stand across the room. Let's sing this together.